Good evening. Welcome to the Chatham Marconi Speaker Series. My name is Liz McCart and I'm a volunteer here. We are so pleased that you have joined us tonight. Tonight we are in front of our exhibit, EPIRB Lifeline for Survival, which ties into our presentation tonight. We developed this exhibit last year as part of our Radio to the Rescue program in which we highlighted the role of radio in distress and rescue. We are pleased that our three speakers are here in person tonight and they will explain how SARSAT works and the amazing technology and people that help rescue people at sea. As a reminder, you can ask questions during the program by typing in the question in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the presentation, our speakers will answer as many questions as possible. It is my privilege today to introduce our three speakers. Mr. Lane Carter serves as the Coast Guard's deputy representative to the Coast Guard Search and Rescue Aided Tracking Program, SARSAT, at Coast Guard headquarters in Washington, DC. He was active duty Coast Guard from 1995 to 2008, where he worked primarily as a search and rescue mission planner. After retiring in 2008, he worked with the Coast Guard as a civilian in a number of roles. Mr. Carter is a graduate of Duquesne University where he earned a Master in Sci of Science in Leadership. Lieutenant Commander Matt Carlton is the U.S. Coast Guard Rescue Coordination Center at Coast Guard Headquarters in Washington, D.C. His first operational assignment was aboard a U.S. Coast Guard cutter in Florida. In 2010, he completed Naval Aviator Training and served as an MH-60T pilot in San Diego and Alaska. In 2017, Lieutenant Commander Carlton transferred to Aviation Training Center where he served as an instructor pilot before moving into his current role in 2021. He is a graduate of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, was a Bachelor of Science in Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering, and earned a Master's in Business Administration from Spring Hill College. Lieutenant Michael Francis assumed the duties as a Command Center Chief for the 1st Coast Guard District in Boston in August 2021. He is responsible for the organization, supervision, and coordination of the command center operations and training. He works closely with the sector command center chiefs in District 1 to craft policy to ensure efficient and effective operations across all 11 Coast Guard mission areas. He serves as command duty op officer acting as a direct representative of the operational commander for all missions in the U.S. Northeast waters. Lieutenant Francis earned his Bachelor of Science in Management from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. Thank you all for being here tonight. It is our pleasure to host you, um, and we really appreciate your coming down from Boston and from Washington to be part of the program. So I'm now I'm going to turn the presentation over to you, Lane. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Liz, for the warm welcome and the whole team here. It's an absolute honor and a privilege to be here speaking with you all tonight. Uh, uh, I, and I'm, I'm going to set the bar a little bit low for you, so I, so you'll be surprised as we go through the uh, the presentation if I say anything smart. Um, our we have a lot of people that go into making the SARSAT program uh, the success it is and advancing the technology. Um, our uh, on the international level, the Cospis Sarset Secretariat, Mr. Stephen Lett, Ms. Cheryl Botoya, they work very hard to uh, keep all these countries uh, moving forward towards providing the best service we can to our, uh, our citizens and the mariners. And on the U.S. side, NOAA is the current uh, program manager and lead federal agency for the U.S. Sarset program. Uh, Mr. Mark Turner is the program manager. There's a wealth of knowledge and engineers that uh, work behind the scenes to keep those satellites uh, flying and the ground stations going. Of course, our other partners, NASA and NOAA, 
uh, I'm sorry, NASA and the U.S. Air Force, uh, they contribute with their expertise as well. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we'll move right into the slides and uh, I look forward to your questions at the end. All right. So the International Cospis SARSET program, uh, it's uh, it, it, the Cospis part, you'll see it's written in Russian there. And I have to trust the folks that built this slide that it actually says, <laughs> which loosely translates into the space system for the search of vessels in distress. Uh, so far, I haven't met anybody that speaks Russian to verify that, but I'm pretty sure that's what it means. And the SARSET side, it's uh, search and rescue satellite aided tracking. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more of how that all works as a program. The whole point of SARSAT is to provide accurate positions uh, when, when you activate that beacon as a mariner. Uh, this, our job is to make sure that that system provides a very accurate position and reduces the amount of time it takes for us uh, to get our search and rescue assets to you. And it's also uh, important that they're timely. Uh, our goals are accurate and timely reports uh, when you're in distress. The whole idea of SARSAT from the very beginning was to try and take the search out of search and rescue. As you can imagine, and as we'll talk about a little bit uh, more as we move on, uh, in the maritime environment, your, your search object is not sitting there in one place waiting for you to come, come and pick them up. They're moving at the mercy of the ocean. Uh, so uh, over time, as if you're hundreds of miles offshore, thousands of miles offshore, um, it could take us a day to get to you depending on how far you are. And that's a lot of hours of drifting. Uh, so this is a, a, a very important goal of the SARSAT programs. We really do want to try and take the search out of search and rescue. All right, a little bit of history on the SARSAT program. The origin goes back to 1972, the Hale Boggs plane crash, which uh, to this day we've never found. At that point, uh, we realized uh, we need something that, to let us know when somebody's in trouble, even when they can't tell us themselves. Uh, so we crafted an MOU between Russia, the United States, Canada, and France, and to this day they remain the uh, four parties to the uh, uh, International Cospis SARSAT program. Um, and we, we joke around every once in a while about, uh, you know, relations change internationally from time to time, but uh, search and rescue is one of those uh, noble missions that uh, seems to transcend those uh, differences. So we actually work very well with our partners, all, all three of our partners on the international stage. Uh, it first became operational in 1982. There was a, a light aircraft crash in Canada. Uh, back then it was a 121.5 uh, 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 signal that shot up to the satellites and would relay down to the uh, ground stations and to the RCCs. And then uh, it became fully operational, meaning we were able to have global coverage and there were enough satellites in the air to give us global coverage in 1985. All right, and here's where we were talking about the four states, uh, Canada, Russia, and France, and the United States. 1988, um, the, the, the four states started providing us, uh, that were providing a space segment, we signed the agreement. And what that essentially did is it, it tied us together as a global community. Um, SAR is a, um, is a global effort. Uh, so that was very important and to this day every few years we uh, we go back to the table and we negotiate the next step in our uh, in our agreements and we all work very hard to make sure that we're all able to continue doing our parts uh, so it, that's what, how we continue to uh, maintain the continuity of the system all right Along with the four parties, we have uh, 43 countries and organizations that also participate in the program. Um, and what this means is uh, we have SAR points of contact where we might uh, use them to relay data or, or distress alerts to other countries in a region. Um, 
they'll listen in. Some of these countries will uh, join in and provide their uh, local expertise or opinions to help us grow the program, advance it into the future, uh, which you'll, you'll see uh, the benefit of some of that as we move forward. Uh, and we have some organizations, uh, Cosesna is one, which is a uh, uh, Central American um, aviation training company that uh, they contract with several countries in uh, Central and South America to provide SAR, SARSAT data. And they've actually turned out to be a fantastic resource for us. Truly a global effort. We average about 2,500 rescues annually across the globe. Uh, the majority of those are merit in the maritime environment. Um, and we're starting to see that uh, uh, personal locator beacons are starting to catch up actually. And we have a lot less uh, uh, ELTs, and, uh, emergency locator transmitter uh, aircraft incidents. Uh, and as you can see, this very colorful uh, map, the, in the yellow is the ELT cases, in the red are the EPIRBs, emergency position indicating radio beacons, and in the blue are the personal locator beacons, um, as you can see, uh, green aviation and uh, purple maritime. I might have gone with some different colors, so maybe next time I'll, I'll choose some different colors. It's hard to see the yellow. All right, so these are the different types of beacons that we have out there on the market. And uh, we're moving into a second gen beacon, which is gonna be even better. Uh, it just, um, there are just some changes that actually NASA and their SAR lab did a fantastic job of uh, helping to develop or developing. Um, but right now we have the emergency position indicating radio beacon, that's maritime for the maritime environment. Uh, and those are distinguished by their ability to uh, activate, uh, depending on whether it's a category one or two, activate if uh, automatically if it's submerged in water. Uh, it's actually a really great feature is, is if you've got some sailors out there, you know that uh, the situation can turn on you in a second and sometimes you just don't have time to reach over and, and set off that emergency device. Uh, well, these beacons, uh, the, right, the right kind, can do that for you. Uh, emergency locator transmitters, they're um, primarily, they're all aviation. So they're, that's what you have in your commercial aircraft. Um, you also have them in civil aviation. And then the new thing on the block is the distress tracker. I'm sure you've all heard of the Malaysia Airlines cases. Um, where uh, the aircraft goes missing and we just don't know what happened to it and we can't find it, it's just missing over the ocean. Um, well, the, the international community got together and uh, they decided it's enough of that. We want to be able to find these folks and, and figure out what happened. So this device actually uh, transmits a position from the aircraft uh, very frequently without, all along the, the flight path and if it meets one of the trigger categories, for example, if it loses power or something like that, without the pilot having to take any action, uh, this device will activate the beacon, it'll send a, a message to the rescue coordination centers, and, uh, and it'll send us the last position. And it'll keep sending us positions along until that, uh, until that problem has corrected itself. Uh, PLBs, those are your personal locator beacons, those are really probably the most uh, popular these days. Uh, hikers use them, kayakers, uh, you name it. Um, I actually know some folks that use theirs on road trips. Um, they'll plug in their road trip uh, route where they're going and, and, and if something happens and their, their friends or family can't, uh, don't get in touch with them, they'll, or can't get in touch with them, or they'll set off that PLB. Uh, so it's, it's got a lot of uses. The SAS beacon, the Ship Secur Security Alert System, there actually aren't too many of those. That's your, uh, uh, your hijacker. If somebody's hijacking a ship, and there's a secret button they can push, and we'll come running. All right. And all of these have the 406 signal and 121.5 megahertz. And I'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. 
All right, so how does this all start? Um, well, of course, it starts by your beacon going off. We have, uh, it, it really is, is lightning fast how this works. You activate that beacon within a minute to two minutes on average, the Rescue Coordination Center has your alert with your position, hopefully, usually your position and your information if you did a great job of registering your beacon. Uh, so we'll go into that here in a second. So they're designed, the beacons themselves, ooh, what happened there? There you go. The beacons themselves are designed for satellite processing. Uh, that, they have a five watt digital signal. The five watt digital signal is tremendously strong. It's, it's way stronger than uh, I could have ever imagined. And I'll give you a quick example. I actually worked a search and rescue case um, in, when I was in New Orleans. Uh, we had a s alert come into our rescue coordination center. And at first the position was not very accurate. We couldn't figure out where it was. And over time it started homing in on this one piece of property uh, about a mile or two inland from the beach. So we called the local authorities and asked them to go by and take a look. Uh, this gentleman had just dug an eight foot hole in his backyard and was throwing some scrap metal away and an old beacon that the battery he thought was dead and the antenna was broken. There was a little bit, it had been raining, so there was a puddle in the, in the bottom of the hole, filled it with dirt and we still found that thing. It was a... <laughs> It was crazy. So they're powerful, and I, I would never underestimate them. If you're in trouble on the ocean and uh, you're wondering, can the Coast Guard see this, this beacon even though I'm you know, uh, trapped under some debris or something like that, I would not underestimate it. It's, it's a very powerful signal. Each beacon has its own unique beacon identification number, and that's a uh, 15 hexadecimal code, uh, numbers and letters, and there's a lot of data and just that helps us identify who owns the beacon. There's a lot of other information that's embedded in that code, a lot, of, a lot more uh, letters and numbers that uh, provide us some great information, but uh, that's a unique code. So when we, when we go to rescue you, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna try and verify that beacon identification to make sure that we've got the right people and we, we weren't just happening upon a, uh, another SAR case. Rigid specifications. So 406s, uh, the, or the EPIRBs, ELTs, and PLBs, they must meet an internationally approved standard and then even more rigorous standards uh, depending on the country. For example, the United States, we, we have some uh, additional requirements that we might require for uh, beacons that are operating in the United States. Uh, but there's a, there's a whole lot of really smart people that look at these beacons and they say, you know, if we want to rescue somebody, it has to meet these exact specifications. And then what will happen is the uh, manufacturer, uh, because they are, uh, they're in the business of helping us save lives as well, um, they will meet those specifications uh, and then we'll give them a, uh, uh, what's called a type approval uh, number. And that lets everybody know that this is a, an approved beacon by the international system. Uh, it, it's, uh, they're very rigid. You can hold one of those and, and another device that uh, just transmits satellite, say like a, you know, another co communications device. And there's an obvious difference in the, uh, the, the build. Uh, the batteries are, are very powerful, uh, you know, waterproof, et cetera. Um, on average, they have about a three to five kilometer uh, location accuracy, and that's without uh, the help of uh, GPS, an embedded G or encoded GPS position. If you have the uh, GPS integrated into your beacon, it's an option and it, at some point all beacons will have uh, GPS encoded positions uh, because they really make a huge difference. 100 meter accuracy or better, it's incredible. And I'll give you an example. So. This is a typical three to five kilometer uh, rate range where we can expect, that's our search area. So this is Washington DC, National Mall. Um, imagine if you're out in the ocean, rough weather, and you, you're trying to get out there and find a uh, uh, person in the water. Um, 
that's a large area to start with, a large area of error. Uh, it's not easy to find uh, uh, people in the water, and, and we'll, we'll get to that here in just a second as well. Um, so if you have a GPS embedded beacon or encoded beacon, that's your range, 100 meters or less. It's very, very accurate. Um, and at this point, I'll just quickly turn over to my compadre here, uh, Matt. He's a 60 pilot, and he's the guy when we, or myself, or, uh, or Mike here, uh, launch a, a helicopter to go out and effect a rescue. Uh, he's the guy that's actually going to go fly that mission. So, I, uh, Matt, tell me a little bit about sure. what it's like to find a PID <clears throat> for PID. Thanks, Lane. Uh, as Lane mentioned earlier, uh, the biggest uh, benefit uh, to the the EPIRB itself um, is taking the search out of the search and rescue. So as you saw on that last picture there with the city of Washington DC and then the mall uh, getting that close that's kind of what the 406 and, and everything will help us do. And then the 121.5 signal that it sends once we get into that right correct area the 125 continuous signal will help us kind of DF uh, to one of those particular intersections or or streets or maybe a you know whatever corner even you know as close as to one of the letters there um, on on the chart uh, so yeah taking the search out is a huge aspect for us it helps us get in the right area you can imagine an aircraft flying along it um, anywhere from you know usually we're conducting searches at 70 to 90 knots so um, at 300 feet in a helicopter so flying flying by trying to find a PIW uh, for example uh, it's like looking for a basketball in, in the middle of the, the Washington Mall there. So um, on, on potentially moving seas and everything like that. So if we can get something that points us in the right direction, it will be a lot easier. And for our fixed wing aircraft, they're usually going to be higher than that. So 500, 1,000 feet. And obviously they can't fly as slow. So they're flying by at a couple hundred miles per hour. And uh, so it's very easy for them to miss stuff. But so the DF uh, certainly helps helps with that. Thanks, Matt. So, as you, yeah, as you can see, it's critically important to have that uh, integrated GPS. So, if you're in a if you're in the market for a, an EPIRB or a PLB, and you have an option, uh, definitely grab the one with the GPS. Okay, that's me. there. We go. All right. So, uh, the United States, we are we we consume a lot of data for these 406 devices. And that's because we, uh, we have some additional regulations, of course, but uh, we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of uh, recreational boaters and hikers. Uh, there's a lot of beacons in the United States. I'll show you a statistic here in a minute. Uh, but internationally, there's uh, vessels over 300 gross tons are required to have them, I mean, perb. Uh, if you're engaged in transporting six or more persons uh, in the United States, you definitely have to have it. Uh, all commercial vessels in the United States and all vessels uh, in Hawaii, just to give you an example of how some of the states are starting to help us out uh, with some of these policies as well. Uh, Hawaii, if you're operating beyond one mile offshore, you must have either a VHF radio or a 406 megahertz EPIRB. And just having that in their policies is tremendously helpful for us because it gets the word out that there is this device that can help you out. Florida has something similar that they've adopted. Um, I think it's a, you get a discount on uh, your vessel registration or something like that if you have an EPIRB. Uh, so we really appreciate that when our, our fellow SAR partners at the states um, help us out. All right, ELTs, aircraft on international flights, of course, must carry an ELT. Uh, I fly a lot and I'm always walking down that aircraft looking at the back, usually in the stern, like in the back of the aircraft, like, where's the ELT? Oh, there it is. Like, I can't grab it and activate it myself or anything, but it just mentally makes me feel good <laughs> when I see it. Um, and the FAA uh, mandates carriage of 406 megahertz uh, EPIRBs. That's also critically important. Um, a lot of civil aviation, uh, they still rely on the 121.5, um, and you know that's something. It helps us out, but boy, if you have a 406, especially with a GPS uh, encoded beacon, uh, that makes our jobs a whole lot easier. All right, 
So uh, I promised you I would give you some statistics about how many beacons there are out there, and here it is. And that number actually, 655,000, is actually uh, now over 700,000. So there are a lot of beacons in our registration database. So uh, I will, toward the end of the presentation, we're going to talk a little bit more about beacon registration, but I think this is a, a good idea, to, or a good point where I can plug our NOAA beacon registration database folks. It's a pretty small team. Uh, as you can imagine, they're managing 650, or over 700,000 beacons uh, in that database. Uh, and it's critically important for us um, because that, that's how we come, that's how we find you. That's, uh, that helps us out, that helps narrow the search area. Um, and then globally, uh, over two and a half million. So there's a lot of beacons out there. Um, at this point, I would like to turn to uh, Mike real quick. Uh, and and I, I want you, can you talk about how uh, the registration, how that helps you out and Absolutely. pack your registration? Absolutely, thanks Lane. So uh, what I would say from the, from the command center perspective, from the rescue coordination center perspective, uh, the thing that makes EPIRB so great, other than just providing us with a location, is providing, providing us with context when it comes to what exactly is happening out on the water. So, uh, you know, as Lane was mentioning, some of the vessels that are required to carry EPIRBs uh, use commercial fishing vessels as an example because that's one that's very prominent uh, in our part of the country. Um, you know, having uh, uh, documentation and points of contact that we can reach out to and make phone calls to uh, before uh, necessarily we decide to launch an asset on an alert uh, enables us to better manage Coast Guard resources in a busy season, you know, uh, busy summer or busy fishing season. You got a lot of boats out on the water that may need assistance. Uh, being able to quickly touch base with points of contact, either businesses or families or the cell phone of the mariner that's actually on the boat and say, you know, hey, this is the Coast Guard, are you actually in distress? Um, I can't tell you how many times that just having that conversation has provided us with the necessary feedback to either affect a rescue uh, or to say, okay, you know, hey, glad to know that you're safe. Um, your EPIRB works. This is a <laughs> successful test. Um, you know, thanks for keeping your registration up to date. Um, you know, I'd, on the flip side of that as well, though, I'd say, you know, for each one of those cases where the registration data points you in the right direction or provides you with helpful information, uh, there's probably another handful or dozen cases even where the registration data is either inaccurate or lacking or non-existent. And then in those cases, obviously, the ambiguity of what's going on in the case uh, increases, your apprehension increases. Uh, it can change the dynamic of an alert very quickly. Uh, when you know less about what's going on. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Well said. All right. So moving all, all along. So in addition to those beacons uh, that, that are required out in the uh, private sector, uh, our military folks rely heavily on these beacons as well. And we have a special database that we, uh, we use to keep track of those and uh, they're extremely helpful. Obviously they train a lot, they train very hard to protect this country. Uh, so domestically, uh, you know, if something goes wrong during training, uh, sometimes this is how we, we know about it and we can join the fight and help, uh, help save, uh, uh, you know, a fellow uh, military member. All right, so next, this is uh, the satellite part probably what some of you folks are pretty interested in. I hope I don't let you down. Uh, if I do, then Noah will let me know about it when we get back. <laughs> All right, so uh, LEOSAR. So we have roughly six low earth orbiting uh, search and rescue satellites. Uh, I think that might be as, uh, down to five now, somewhere that they're way beyond their, um, their expected lifespan. Um, and we'll touch on that here in a little bit. Uh, and, we, and then we have uh, eight GEOSARs, that's uh, geostationary orbiting uh, search and rescue satellites. And then our new baby, which is only a you know, few years old, um, and we're still working towards uh, putting some final touches on it, uh, is the medium uh, Earth orbiting sa uh, search and rescue satellites. We have about 45 now. Um, they use GPS-3. Uh, for the U.S., um, and then Galileo for the European Union, and then GLONASS for Russia. And we'll touch on the differences between each of these and why they're so important to us. 
All right, so the Leos, um, they uh, hover around an altitude, they're orbiting around an altitude of 800 kilometers. They go pole to pole, um, and they complete an orbit about every 100 minutes. And that's an important number to keep in mind. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, they perform Doppler locating function. Uh, so that's a primary means of locating. So it's not nothing like GPS, Doppler, you, uh, I always use the analogy of the, the ambulance, uh, that siren as it's getting closer to you and then going away, it can you just kind of idea of where it is. That's, that's how our, our LEO satellites uh, work. Um, so what we'll get sometimes from the LEOs is because there's so few of them and they're on a 100 minute orbit, is we'll get a, uh, for example, a, a satellites going over the horizon and it detects a signal from, the, from an EPIRB. Now that EPIRB signal goes out about roughly 50 to 51 every 50 to 52 seconds. And that's a, you know, to help save some battery and make sure we, we have enough time to hone in on the position. But one every 50, 50 to 52 seconds so it might only be in visibility of a satellite for a, a minute or a couple of minutes, and you're trying to get that Doppler position uh, in that short period of time. LEOs are, have served us very well for many years, uh, but one of the flaws is um, we'll get a, what we call a uh, split resolution uh, where we'll get an alpha position and a likely image position, uh, the Bravo position. And those positions can be uh, a thousand miles apart, you know, you know, on a bad day. Um, so that that's significant for our search and rescue coordinators, uh, our planners, and our mission coordinators. Um, and I, I guess, real quick, uh, Mike, can you tell me a, uh, in a search and rescue case if you have a 50-50 a split, uh, what does that do for you? How do you plan a mission like that? So there's, there's a couple of different things to consider with a 50-50 split. Um, first and foremost, you know, as you mentioned with LEOSAR, uh, if it's not accompanied by any other, uh, any other hits from any other satellites, um, there are a lot of different reasons why that would only hit once. Um, and if it only hits that once and you get the 50-50 split, it's 1,000 miles apart. You know, we talked before about ambiguity going up, apprehension going up. Uh, the reason this is such a problem is because both of those things have gone up uh, and your ability to differentiate between which one of those positions is legitimate uh, goes way down at that point. Um, so the best, you know, the, really the best thing you can do uh, is look for a registration information, look for previous hits on that beacon ID, uh, try to figure out to the best of your ability what the most plausible scenario is, what the most plausible situation is, uh, and if, if you can't get past uh, the apprehension that you have, obviously, you launch on that on that alpha solution if that's the one you have. If you have a Bravo solution, you can't coordinate with another RCC, you launch on that Bravo solution. Now, the point here is to save lives. Uh, obviously, we want to we want to manage resources at the same time, uh, but we're always going to defer to hitting it hard, hitting it fast. Thanks, Mike. So our helicopter pilots, like uh, my my good friend Matt here, really appreciate when we try and give them a a good place to go and we don't uh, put them out over the water for hours on end. Um, the more accurate uh, starting location we can give them, uh, the better chance they can have to affect a rescue and they also like to look good on TV. So that's very important <laughs> to a pilot. So if you're a pilot, you understand what I'm talking about. All right, for the next slide. So um, our Geos, uh, GeoSAR satellites, uh, those are really uh, primarily just to let us know that an event has happened. So what they do is they, if there's no embedded position, the GPS position, all it really does is it'll, it'll relay the, the, the code, the beacon ID to us, and we can decode that. And he, uh, Mike can start doing those phone calls that he was talking about and trying to track down uh, where the beacon is. Um, and then pretty quick, usually a... Uh, um, a uh, Leo or, or a Mio will come, around, come along and give us a position. Um, so no Doppler or independent location capability on those satellites. And of course the Leo SAR, as we mentioned, uh, there's a wait time between satellite passes. I personally, I, I remember prior to uh, the Mio satellite uh, satellites coming along, um, they, uh, we would 
we would be sitting in there with a, a, a poor position or some sort of split resolution and we'd have to wait an hour, an hour and a half for another satellite to come along and that's a lifetime for a mariner if you're um, you know, doggy paddling for your life in, in rough weather. Um, every second counts. So uh, the next satellite, this current satellite system I'm about to talk to you about, uh, it truly is uh, a, a real fantastic addition to our search and rescue tools that we have in our bag. All right, medium earth orbit satellites. We have about 45 of them starting to grow. Um, they have uh, SAR repeaters on the GNSS satellites. They hover around an altitude of, uh, orbit around an altitude of 24,000 kilometers. You have to forgive me, I keep saying hover because I'm sitting next to a helicopter pilot and they <laughs> do a lot of that. So um, improved position accuracy. Um, and the reason for that is uh, these satellites are listening 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're always in view of our uh, the, pretty much the majority of the globe. So when, when a, a beacon activates, we don't have to wait for uh, a LEO to come around. Uh, we have satellites that are watching and listening right now. Uh, at the beginning of the presentation, you might have heard me mention that it takes about a minute, two minutes to get all the way down to the RCC. Um, well, that, when, that's when you have a position from a satellite. So if we were waiting for a, a satellite to come around in orbit, you know, we'd have to wait an hour for it to dump a position to us uh, through the ground system, we'll talk about that in a second, and get it to the RCC. Well now, when we get a position, uh, one to two minutes, it's in our rescue coordination center on average. All right, so here's just a, a good example of the different footprints. Uh, this is a LEO SAR footprint. Uh, it carries a SAR repeater basically got a pretty a small memory in it and uh, takes and stores the, the data and then it dumps it down at, at a uh, ground station once it's within view. And of course the geostationary, uh, they're around 36,000 kilometers in a fixed orbit um, and it's an instantaneous alert so it's always looking as well. It just doesn't have that uh, position determining um, capability. So if you have a, a GPS in, in equip, equipped beacon, uh, it will relay a position to you, but if it, it doesn't, then of course we have to wait for a MEO or LEO to pick it up. Nowadays we rarely see uh, geo positions because MEO is so fantastic and gets us uh, information so quickly. And there's your geo satellite footprint. Three geo satellites uh, are required to cover the entire Earth. All right, and MEOSAR. So MEO's got a, a larger footprint, obviously, it's at a higher altitude. Uh, it's got a larger uh, footprint than LEO and it combines all the best technologies. And I don't know if I did that, sorry. Uh, all the best technologies from both the LEO and GEO, the instantaneous uh, notification and the uh, position, to, uh, the ability to determine the position. All right, uh, the over this so the ground station. Let's talk quickly about the ground station. We have local user terminals. This is, uh, this is how we track the satellites and uh, this is where the satellites dump the position information. Uh, so it recovers the, the beacon information and for, um, uh, for Doppler, uh, that's your LEOs and then for uh, MEOs, they use difference uh, difference of arrival to determine the position and it's then we'll send the signal from the local user terminal directly to a mission uh, control center uh, for us the United States our uh, US mission control centers uh, in Suitland Maryland uh, and it's staffed by a, a lot of uh, really expert professionals and they're basically just making sure that the data looks good the satellites are talking to each other and they're there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All right, there's your mission control center. We have 30 of them worldwide. Um, and like I said, they, they validate, match, and merge uh, distress alerts. Um, they provide the beacon registration info. That's where our 
uh, beacon registration uh, database folks are. Uh, and then they will, from there, transmit the message to a rescue coordination center. All of this happens without any human interaction. When you hit that button on your, or when you activate that EPIRB, it goes directly from your EPIRB, directly to the satellite, directly to the local, the uh, LUT, the local user terminal, from there to the uh, USMCC, and then to the rescue coordination center in 60 seconds, you know, 120 seconds on average, and without any human touching it. It's a fascinating uh, technology. Okay, my favorite part of this presentation, <laughs> Rescue Coordination Center. So what do we do with all this information? And so for that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, uh, the Rescue Coordination Center, Boston's uh, chief, uh, Mike, and he's gonna run you through uh, a couple examples of what they do with this information. Thanks, Lane. So, you know, as Lane was just saying, so we receive the distress beacon alerts from uh, the USMCC. And the way that comes across is in the beacon alert that you can see there in the, uh, the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, and basically, it's going to run through a, a litany of information, starting with the hexadecimal ID, uh, which Lane mentioned earlier, which essentially identifies the beacon and provides us with kind of the, um, the name to associate with whoever is registered to that beacon. So when we go into the database, that's what we're going to search for first, is that beacon ID. And hopefully, if properly registered, uh, we have a bunch of registration information available if it's not provided right there on the alert. Uh, in a perfect world, this alert would give me uh, a position. Uh, in an even more perfect world, it would be uh, an encoded position, so I'd have GPS accuracy on that position. Uh, and then down below, it would go through uh, what country, like what nationality that vessel is assigned to, uh, the name of the registered owner uh, or operator, if that be the case. Uh, if there's like a consistent master on a boat that's not the owner, that can be listed. Uh, primary and secondary contacts uh, to reach out to, home addresses to look into. Um, and then down at the very bottom, in some instances, we'll have uh, what's called special status. So that can be, uh, you know, I sold my beacon. It can be I destroyed my beacon. Um, and those special statuses can also provide a lot of context. You can go to the next slide, Lane. So... We have two, uh, two quick cases that I'm kind of going to kind of brush on. Uh, the first is the Aaron and Melissa 2, uh, which is a case happened about 55 miles south of Rockland, Maine. Uh, there was a crew on a fishing vessel, uh, Aaron and Melissa, uh, that abandoned their ship into their life raft, manually activated their emergency beacon from that life raft. Uh, we launched a 60 from Cape Cod. Helicopter was able to get on scene, recover all the folks uh, in the life raft. So there's a kind of an example of, hey, we have great positional data. We can launch a 60 as soon as we see, um, as soon as we see a fishing vessel's beacon alert with accurate positional data in the maritime domain. Uh, the lag time between us receiving that beacon alert and us getting an asset departing from Air Station Cape Cod is usually around 30 minutes. And that's including like warming up the aircraft, getting the aircraft up in the air. Um, and so at that point, it's all about transit time and where you are in the world, how quickly we can respond. So this is a good example of what happens when you've got good positional data and, and a beacon that was properly activated by a mariner. Go to the next one. This one is the uh, sailing vessel Sedona. So obviously a slightly different uh, situation here. 43 foot sailing vessel, about 150 nautical miles south of Nantucket. Um, great thing here is that within this registration data, uh, there's a satellite phone listed. Uh, watch standards in the RCC were able to reach out directly to the mariners via that satellite phone. Uh, and that provides us with an absolutely invaluable link. Uh, the RCC, unlike a sector, doesn't have, not that it would have helped in this situation, but doesn't have even VHF communications. So the RCC itself, uh, if we're going to reach out and actually touch a mariner, uh, it's going to be through some type of satellite communication uh, or a relay from a, a unit on scene. Uh, so this is a really good example of, uh, you know, solid registration, being able to communicate with the mariner, uh, and again, you know, getting our, our you know, top, uh, top of the line 60 Jayhawk pilots out there uh, rescuing folks out of the water, doing all the hard work. And then, so not listed here in the, in the PowerPoint, but I think a, a really useful case uh, and a, a slightly more recent case 
Um, roughly about six months ago, we had a fishing vessel about 80 nautical miles off of Cape Cod um, that activated their EPIRB manually. Um, and what, what ended up happening was the EPIRB alert that we received, that, that sheet on the right side of your screen there, uh, was fully fleshed out. It had primary and secondary contacts. The name of the company was listed. Um, they had some sat phone comms listed, but we couldn't get through on the sat phone comms. We ended up contacting the company who informed us that they, the boat was definitely underway uh, and had a sister ship nearby. And we were able to get the sister ship satellite phone number from the company who we then contacted uh, via our phone. And we were able to turn their sister ship towards uh, you know, the fishing vessel that was apparently in distress uh, while we were simultaneously launching uh, a 60 from Cape Cod. All of this took place in about 30 minutes uh, and in that span of time, come to find out, the fishing vessel that was in distress was actually getting completely engulfed in, in flames. Um, the sister ship had told us that there was some hydraulic issue going on earlier in the day, uh, so that all kind of checked out. Uh, by the time the 60 got on scene, uh, about an hour or so later, uh, all five uh, crew members were on the stern of the boat. Uh, they were instructed to jump into the water. Uh, 60 swimmer uh, went down, plucked all five of them out. Um, and they all got home safe, no injuries, no concerns. Uh, I think that just, you know, to me that highlights as a, a SAR, um, as a search and rescue professional, this is the way the system's really intended to work. Uh, there's this amazing tool that you can have where if you properly register it and you put the information uh, requested into that system, uh, SAR controllers like myself and the guys that work at the RCC, we can go through all the channels we need to to make sure we get the right asset to you in a short amount of time or as short amount of time as possible uh, to effect a rescue. Yeah, next slide, I think. A couple more. There we go. Okay, go back one. All right. So thank you very much, Absolutely. Frank. Um, finite resources. We don't we don't have a ton of resources available. Uh, they're they're precious, obviously, and there's a lot of boaters out there, a lot of people that need help. Uh, so the, the easier our job is, uh, the, the satellites make our job a lot easier uh, by narrowing down that position, getting us a quick notification, and not uh, having our, so we can take advantage of that precious resource time. Uh, and it's risky, of course, flying a helicopter and uh, the type of weather these folks fly in uh, sometimes is it's pretty risky. Affecting a, doing a hoist is, is really risky. So. If we can limit that, um, we are we are very much appreciate that, and this system works great for that. So let me just touch on a couple of best practices with your beacon. I'm not sure how many uh, mariners are there are on listening with uh, that own an EPIRB or a PLB or an ELT, uh, but if you do, the, the the beacon transmits best when you have a clear view of the uh, sky. So you want to have it the antenna deployed uh, away from your body, clear view of the sky, and that's standard uh, communications 101. You don't want to have anything blocking your signal. Uh, and then don't turn your beacon on and off uh, to save power. Turn it on. The more data we get from the satellites, the more accurate the position is going to be uh, and the less searching we have to do. We can take the search out of the search and rescue. Registration. So as uh, Mike was talking about, registration is critically important to us. Uh, it helps us piece together missing pieces of the puzzle. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes we don't, if, if there's some reason why we don't have the best uh, position right away, it could be that the beacon's obstructed uh, somehow, it's caught up under the hull, something along those lines. Uh, if we have some information uh, on the owners or emergency contacts and they know where you were, uh, that's tremendously helpful for us. That helps us uh, put together your last steps, piece together your last steps, develop a uh, search pattern, and then get our, make best use, uh, efficient use of our resources. Yes, sir. Mike. If you, if you don't mind me cutting in there, Lane, um, on the recesses, resources piece. Um, so, I, you know, I, I didn't really mention those three SAR cases because those are obviously real, uh, real distress situations, real activations of an EPIRB. Um, you know, there, for every one of those cases, there's, you know, 10 or 20 cases where the registration information uh, is accurate, you're able to make a phone call to a family member or to the owner 
and say, you know, hey, are you in distress? Uh, is the boat out on the water? Uh, more often than not, the answer to that question is no, I'm safe. The boat's on the hard. I mean, any type of nor'easter that comes through or a hurricane, uh, if that's what the Northeast is feeling for that particular year, um, all of those situations can activate an EPIRB erroneously. Um, and again, that, you know, that active registration, that accurate registration um, helps us to uh, conserve resource hours. Uh, to Lane's point, uh, for, your, for your reference, we have six total aircraft in New England. That's from Sandy Hook all the way up to Quoty Point. Um, three of those are helos and three of those are, are fixed-wing aircraft. So if you consider any given point in time with maintenance and what have you, you know, we might have one helo for the day. We might have two aircraft total for the day. Um, and that means that we have to be very judicious in how we go about uh, executing our missions. Not to say we would ever hold back but to say that we're, we are contemplating every decision we make very thoroughly. Uh, so the more information we can have, the better. Thanks, Lane. Great, uh, great points, Mike. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out that um, our, uh, the United States, we're very assertive and very aggressive when it comes to search and rescue. Uh, we take the lives of our, our citizens very seriously. And if you're in the search and rescue business, uh, you're doing it because you have a passion for saving lives. So uh, every, uh, when we talk about uh, it takes us 30 minutes to get airborne, uh, Matt will tell you uh, we can get that down to 10 or 15 or whatever. <laughs> you know, that's the way we operate. We really want to uh, move as fast as we can um, because you, your lives are very important to us. That's what we're here to do. All right. So let's see. Next slide. Okay, testing. Um, there's a testing protocol for your for all beacons. Is a specific process you go to actually test the beacon, and that just lets you know that your your beacon is capable of sending up a signal to the satellites. Uh, that's important to know because obviously you want to uh, when you go out on a voyage, you want to know that your beacon works. So we recommend definitely testing testing your beacon, but follow the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, if you don't have manufacturer's instructions. Uh, there's a nifty little site that I came across recently called Google. You can get on there and it, it has every answer to every question you could possibly imagine. All right. Definitely ensure your batteries are, are not expired. Um, as I said, the batteries are very powerful. They last a long time. Uh, but uh, the more that beacon is activated uh, or or the more if, it, if it's a couple false alerts here and there uh, that drains down your battery power so if you accidentally activate your beacon or if you activate it uh, in an actual distress I would strongly consider uh, having that battery replaced you want it fresh and ready for you all right the bottom line is uh, COSPA SAR set system it's here to save lives um, you're a big part of that you, you help us out in the community and uh, educating your fellow, uh, what you hear today, your fellow mariners or your pilots, um, proper beacon registration techniques, and uh, I'll just say one more thing. Uh, satellites, uh, I, t I, was, I was around before we really started um, leveraging the MEOSAR, the Mid-Earth Orbiting, and it was complicated. The advances we've made in technology are a real credit to our NOAA, NASA, Air Force and Coast Guard and international community. So thank you very much and I'll turn it over to Liz. Okay, um, thank, thank to all three of you. That was a fabulous presentation. I think it, it helped us understand this amazing technology um, that really helps rescue people and, and the work that um, the Coast Guard does on a daily basis to, um, to get out there and save people. So it's now time for questions and answers. If um, the audience has any, they can, you can type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and as it turns out, we already do have questions coming in. Um, the first question is, how do you know which type of equipment aircraft to send out to, to look for um, an EPIRB that has gone off? So that's, that's a great question. I think I'll, I'll share the answer with, uh, with Mike. Um, so we, we, we know our SAR planners and our SAR mission coordinators, they know the, uh, the capabilities and the limitations of every resource at our disposal. 
Uh, so when we look at uh, what is the appropriate asset for that mission, we're looking at range, we're looking at uh, minimum weather capabilities, it's not just for aircraft but also for vessels, um, and, and we're looking at also uh, what, what's available in distance. So I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, off the west coast uh, in RCC Alameda's SAR region, uh, they do a lot of search and rescue cases about 1,000 miles offshore, way out there. Well, we don't have helicopters that can fly that, that far. I, I don't think we do. Matt can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure we don't. So what we do is we rely on our, our, our community, our, our mariners, maybe uh, the uh, Amver vessels or other mariners passing through, and uh, also on our pararescue jumpers of the United States Air Force. Uh, those incredibly brave men and women uh, we, we'll launch them, they'll go out, they will jump out of the back of a perfectly good aircraft, dive into the water and, and, and save you and ride you all the way back. They're, they're incredible. Um, so it's a big community effort. Uh, Mike, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think that's, that's a pretty good description, Lane. I think, um, you know, in general, what asset is most appropriate depends on a whole host of factors. Um, you know, distance from, obviously from uh, where that asset would be coming from, that search and rescue unit. Uh, so in the, in the instance of an aircraft, how close is the air station? Uh, small boat, how close is the boat station? Cutter, where are they positioned currently on their patrol? And each one of those things changes the outlook of a SAR case. Um, you know, obviously a patrol boat, you might want to be on scene for an extended search. Uh, if it's something that's gonna take days and days, you know, maybe you have an 87 foot cutter out uh, conducting searches on that. Uh, if it's something that's over a, a very wide area, uh, you know, hundreds of square nautical miles. That's something that feels like a, a job for a 144, a CASA, or a C-130, something that's got a lot of legs that can, you know, do searches for hours at high altitude and give you good information back. Um, and obviously, you know, good, uh, good datum, good positioning, um, where you know where you need to get a search and rescue asset as soon as possible. There's nothing better than a, yeah. than a 60. That's great, thank you for that. And just to clarify, Doug had a question about whether you um, would contact the closest ship and request help. So it sounds like that sometimes you do that. Absolutely, we have uh, uh, a variety of ways of determining where ships are. A lot of it depends on whether they have uh, automatic positioning equipment on board, mm -hmm. AIS, things like that. Um, but we also have uh, this, as we mentioned, the Amber system. Uh, you know, it, it, that is a, an incredible volunteer service by uh, merchant marines, or merchant uh, vessels all over the world. Uh, we are constantly tracking their locations and we'll request that they divert and uh, go effect a rescue. And I, I gotta tell you, in my 25 years of planning search and rescue cases, I've never had a mariner say, I'm not gonna go. Yeah. Sort of a rule of the sea, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Julie would like to know um, about the rescue swimmers. So the, the rescue swimmers are part of um, the helicopter crew? Sure, yes. And, and then the second part of the question is how, how do, and where are they trained? Yeah, I can uh, answer that. The, the where they train, uh, that's the easiest uh, part of that question. <laughs> so uh, their basic training is conducted uh, in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, uh, where they, they go to a, a school for a couple months. And then once they finish that, um, they end up going out to uh, a unit, an air station somewhere. And from there, they'll get actually qualified in their aircraft to be a, a rescue swimmer and, and go out and conduct the mission. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes into their training, a lot of physical training. Swimming, they obviously have to be very comfortable uh, in the water because um, they're, they're the ones that we're going to lower down, obviously, into the, the stormy waves and everything where I'm sitting in the nice warm helicopter. They're actually going down. Uh, and getting in in that water so uh, they're also uh, they all receive basic medical training so basic EMT and and some of them go above and beyond that and get extra medical training uh, as well and then we do also have advanced schools uh, that they can go to there's one in uh, Astoria Oregon that takes advantage of the weather conditions on the Columbia River bar uh, the sea states there and close proximity to shore and predictability of it allows uh, not just swimmers but pilots and our flight mechanics who are the ones operating the hoist to get them that training and get them in those conditions uh, to practice the, the bigger waves and and things like that. So, 
Okay, thank you. So when the helicopter is deployed, the swimmers are automatically on board? 99% of the time, yes, yeah, there okay. will be a, a swimmer, so especially if it, if it is a SAR launch um, and, and it's already aircraft, there will be a rescue swimmer on board. There are certainly times uh, where we're conducting different types of, of training, uh, could be just pilot training, um, where there, there may not be a rescue swimmer. But if we're going to get launched out onto a SAR case, whether it's a, an EPIRB or ELT or something like that, we are going to go back to the air station to to pick up a, a rescue swimmer to take with us, for sure. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and this will be our last question, and it, this is a great great one because I think you piqued some interest here. What is, this is an anonymous attendee, would like to know, what is the price range for a personal beacon? That's pretty easy too. They're in the two, two, $200 range, two to $250 range. Uh, this, again, I, I, when I told you about that incredible website I found, the, the, uh, Google, I would rely on that more than I would rely on my own opinion here. But from my personal experience, they're generally in the $200 range. And uh, it's important to note, there's no subscription fee for that either. You buy that beacon and uh, for the rest of the time you have that beacon, uh, uh, it works without any subscription fees. You just register it and you're good to go. Uh, and we don't charge for search and rescue. So if you're in distress, don't hesitate to, to let us know. Well, thank you. We're about out of time. Um, and as uh, again, I'd like to uh, thank our speakers once again for this wonderful and informative um, presentation. Just uh, knowing about the technology, the international cooperation, as well as um, if distress happens, we have some quick response right here in Boston and in Joint Base, so we appreciate that. So as a small token of our appreciation, we want to give oh, you, um, you each much. a Chatham Marconi Maritime right, Center you, hat to you. wear. Thank you. And That's hopefully great. see you again soon. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I'd um, like to thank our audience for attending tonight, your support through membership, through participation in these videos, through um, coming to the museum is fabulous. I uh, want to highlight an upcoming event that we're having on September 9th. Um, this will be our first in-person audience um, presentation um, at Mass Maritime with Zoom, also to home viewers and Zoom to Chatham Orpheum. It will be um, Jean Kelly, who was one of three survivors on the sinking of the SS Marine Electric in 1983. He's going to tell his story and will be joined by author Bob Frump, who wrote the book about the tragedy and the subsequent investigation um, and uh, remediations that happened. And actually the Coast Guard Swimmer Program was one of the positive outcomes that came of that. So we look forward to um, seeing you or having you tune in to uh, that presentation. Thank you and good night. <laughs>